Hey everybody, it's Ben here. Uh, recently a viewer asked if we could do a video tour of my electric car. So right next to me, this is a 2012 model year Mitsubishi iMeV. This is a battery electric vehicle. You plug it into the wall to charge batteries and it uses an electric motor. It's not a hybrid, it's not a gas car, it's not a plug-in hybrid. It's a straight up electric car. So let's take a look at it. So we'll start off just doing a walk around of the car. This is a 2012 model year. I paid $7,000 for it as the second owner of the car. Just wrote a check to a used car dealer lot and drove it home. Uh, equivalent Nissan Leafs were $12,000 in the area at my time and equivalent Volts were about $15,000 at the time. And of course there have been great advances in electric cars since then. Um, this car only has a 16 kilowatt hour battery pack. That's pretty small. Uh, basically it's the same size battery as a Chevy Volt except the Volt also has an engine in there. Um, the advantage of this car is it's a lot less expensive. It's also a smaller car meaning it's very, very easy to park and it has an excellent turning radius. Now, uh, to state the obvious, it is a compact car. It's a four-door hatchback, four-seater. Uh, it is a bit narrow, similar to something like a Geo Metro. There's not a, a big console between the driver and the passenger. So width-wise, it's a little snug if you're driving with a passenger. Uh, most of the time, uh, I'm just driving by myself, me with tools and that sort of thing. Um, and as a commuter car, it's, it's really fantastic. So let's take a look under the hood here. The hood release is on the passenger side, which I always thought was a little weird, uh, but this is actually based on a Japanese car. So I figure uh, that's probably why it's on the right is that would have been the driver's side in Japan. So there's actually not too much to see under the hood. And one of the reasons why is because it's a rear wheel drive car. Uh, so under the hood, we've got the battery, power steering fluid, um, fuse box, things like that. And then I also, um, we'll talk about this more in a bit, but I added a heater. And so that's a one liter um, alcohol fuel tank. And over on this side, this is the connections that tap in for the heater. And this is actually coolant for the heater system. Uh, the car does have pretty good headlights. Um, it has these really nice projection beam headlights. Uh, I also upgraded those to LED. Uh, this car also has uh, fog lights and daytime running lights. Uh, this is the higher trim level version of the 2012 model year. Uh, the lower trim one did not have the fog lights on it. So I've got LED fog lights and headlights and then I kept the traditional incandescent high beams and fog lights and one of the reasons why is I figured if it was ever like a big ice storm, the LEDs may not actually melt the ice off of the headlights, uh, whereas the incandescents could. That aftermarket heater that I installed, you really can't see it, but basically it's mounted down here, uh, kind of behind that front bumper cover. So you really can't see much of it at all. You can see a little tiny bit through the grill here. Uh, that's actually the muffler uh, from the fuel burning heater that I installed on here. The car is a hatchback. I love hatchbacks because you can fit so much in them. And this is a rear wheel drive car. So the uh, engine compartment, if you will, is actually down underneath this panel. Uh, you can also see that I added a piece of plywood. Uh, the reason why is I really use this vehicle much more like a, uh, a truck than a car. I'm typically hauling equipment in it uh, rather than people. And that was one of my considerations with this car. So if we take a look inside, one thing I like about this is the seats actually fold down flat. So if I fold both seats down, it's actually a pretty good uh, cargo area back here. And then I have another piece of plywood that I've typically been setting on top of here uh, to protect the interior. So it's a four seater car, but most of the time I'm actually using it uh, more like a pickup truck. Uh, two-seater with a lot of cargo space in the back here. So now what I just did was I put that piece of plywood in the back with both seats folded down and it's a it's a completely flat area and that is not something that you get with uh, for example a, a Nissan Leaf. Uh, this feature in itself was one of the reasons why I was interested in this car uh, versus some other cars out there. Uh, great cargo space and it's almost minivan-esque in terms of uh, how wide it opens up. 
And while it's not that interesting, most people don't usually get to see it. So I'll open up the, the uh, motor compartment and we'll take a look inside. So in this car, the electric motor is down underneath this cover in the back. We got to take out four of these big wing nuts or wing bolts, actually, I think. So with the bolts out, we can take off this cover and we can see mostly that just it's uh, dusty. This is a, it's an engine compartment. Uh, back here, you can see the high power connections and there's five of them. So two of those are gonna be for the battery, positive and negative, and three of those are going to be the phase cables going to the motor, which is directly under the inverter. You really, you can't see too much of it. Um, I think right here, I believe that's the charger. And then we have a little, um, coolant tank for the liquid cooling of the power electronics. Uh, if we look under the car, oh boy, not a good view here. Um, well, right there, there's the electric motor. Uh, really doesn't look like a whole lot and it just goes to a single speed uh, gear reduction and then that splits the power to the, the two rear wheels. Uh, while we're here, I'll also show you my hitch. So this is a two inch receiver. Uh, this is from a company called Torque Lift Central. Uh, it is rock solid. And because this is a rear wheel drive vehicle, um, it's basically the equivalent of towing with a pickup truck, but there's no gears to go through, no shifting, anything like that. And what I do when I'm towing is I pop the gear selector down into the B, the regenerative braking mode where it's uh, extra heavy regenerative brakes and it works really, really well. Now, if you also happen to be a Mitsubishi iMeve owner, uh, these little wing bolts that hold that cover down, I recommend you pull them out and put a little anti-seize on here because uh, going through the other end of these bolts is exposed to the outdoor elements and it's gonna rust, especially if you're someplace like I am where we put salt on the roads all winter to help melt the snow and ice. Um, so if you ever want those bolts to come back out, put some anti-seize on there. Now, another thing, because I added the, uh, the towing package to this, is I needed the wiring uh, for the trailer, which is just the typical flat four. So back here, I installed this little uh, Kurt brand uh, box. Uh, pretty easy to connect right into the existing taillight wiring harness back here. And then I just have my little pigtail that pulls out for towing. Uh, I've got a good couple of feet here, so I just pull it out. Uh, slam it in the hatch, plug this into my trailer, and I'm all set to tow. And I've got a blog entry about uh, installing the towing package, so check that out for more details. As for the interior of the car, it's pretty basic overall, which uh, some aspects of that I like. Um, I mean, it's just kind of your plastic and cloth interior, nothing too crazy here. Uh, of course, we do have uh, power windows, power door locks. Now, I did get the higher grade trim level of this car. So it does have the steering wheel mounted controls for uh, volume and mode controls for the stereo. It has Bluetooth for uh, using the phone. Controls are right here. And it has the upgraded uh, versus the standard um, sound package, driver and passenger airbags, of course. Now this car does only have three cup holders and two of them flip down right in front of your front vents. Uh, that's fine for the winter, but in the summer that blocks the air conditioner. So not a perfect design. Uh, also, this is a Japanese based car. So it's designed for basically a 12 ounce can of soda or a coffee cup or something, but the American bladder buster soda does not fit in there. Uh, third cup holder right down here by the parking brake. Again, just a basic little cup holder. Right here in the center is the HVAC controls. They're very intuitive, easy to use, just nice big knobs, turn them on, and they work exactly the way you think they should. Um, it drives me a little crazy that on our 2004 Prius, you have to do everything through the touch screen to adjust the heater. Now, I also mentioned that I added that aftermarket heater. So this right here, is the control for that. It's very, very simple. You press the button, uh, it turns on the timer, it's gonna start um, kicking a little fuel pump, click, 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 click. And then all you have to do is just turn on the, the fan to blow the air. And then in terms of the hot or cool, normally being in the cool position would 
run the air conditioner. Normally in the hot would run the electric heat, which unfortunately um, it's a, a pretty heavy drain on the battery. And it's not a fantastic heater either. It's just resistive heat. It's not using a heat pump like a lot of the later electric cars used. So all I have to do is while I'm driving, if I want to use uh, the fuel burning heater, which I, I don't always do that in the winter. I mean, if it's just a short trip, yeah, I still just use the electric heat. Uh, but I just make sure that on the heater, it was in the hot position and I turn it to neutral so that it, uh, it's not using the electric heater at all and turn on some air and I get that hot air blowing out from that fuel burning heater. Then if I want to cancel it, just have to hit that again. So to turn on the car, I just put the key in and turn it all the way to the crank position, just, just exactly like a gas car. You hear the little bing bong, everything turns on. Um, I actually really like the instrument, uh, the instrumentation in this car. It's nice and simple. Uh, if I accelerate, that needle goes up. If I hit the brakes and I regenerate, uh, the needle goes to the left, showing how much regenerative braking I'm capturing. Speedometer in the middle, nice and simple. Up here is how many miles uh, the car expects I can drive right now, uh, based on how much juice I have. Uh, over here, we've got our juice-o-meter. Um, this car has a 16 kilowatt hour battery pack, and each one of those little ticks, there's 16 of them, so basically each one um, shows a, about one kilowatt hour of energy. And typically a car like this can go about four miles per kilowatt hour. So basically it's designed for about 64 miles uh, of range per charge. Of course, that depends on weather and how you drive and how fast you're going and everything like that. Uh, right now, the estimate is that I could go 63 miles uh, right now, but I just came off the charge and I know that when I was coming back home with this car I was driving very very modestly So I know that that's an overestimate, but yeah six, about 60 miles is typical in the summer uh, However in the winter if I'm running that heat that can really take a dent um, If heat's going continuously it could actually drop range down to about as little as 40 miles uh, but keep in mind that the average American drives 30 to 40 miles per day. So even in the worst case situation, it's still a great car for commuting in the average American driver. Now, if you need something different, that's fine. Uh, the Chevy Volt is a great car. Um, right now, the Chevy Bolt with a B is out and the Tesla models, uh, Model 3s are coming out now as well. And those all go over 200 miles per charge. I actually really happen to like the stereo in this car. I've got the car on and you can see, uh, for example, if we go to mode, we've got AM, FM, uh, USB or iPod input, Bluetooth audio from a smartphone. Um, that's kind of cool. Uh, music server is also a cool one. Um, there's actually a hard drive in this car. And when you pop a CD in, it will automatically rip the CD into the internal hard drive. So right back here, there's the CD player. Um, I can play CDs directly, of course, but the fact that it just rips them to an internal hard drive is pretty cool. And because I was the second owner of this car, uh, when I bought it, there was actually already some uh, music in there, uh, which was pretty cool for the drive home. Uh, there's some other features on here. Uh, navigation, so it's got a built-in GPS, maps, um, you know, some other things like that. And then, of course, the settings. Um, personalize it how you want, of course. But mostly it's a pretty good stereo system. The other thing is that if we put the car into reverse, it's also a backup camera. Uh, I've never had a car with a backup camera on it before. Great feature, especially if you're towing, it makes uh, backing up to hitch to a trailer really, really super easy. The car also has a couple of different driving modes. It drives as though it was an automatic, although there's no uh, traditional gearing in it. Um, it it's single-speed gearing. Uh, this car tops out at a little over 80 miles an hour. Um, so all I have to do is grab the brake and put the car in gear, and we're ready to roll right now. Um, this is the first car I've ever owned that has had this style <laughs> for the the gear selection on that i've never had a car like that before reverse uh we all understand what that neutral and drive are eco and b are two other driving modes 
Um, a lot of cars now are starting to have other driving modes. Uh, the Chevy Volt has a sport mode, for example, or uh, the Prius for a long time has had a B mode in it. So what this does is D drives about how you would expect an automatic transmission to. E, Eco, um, what it does is you have to push down further on the accelerator uh, to really get going, but it's an economy mode. It makes you drive like a grandma, it uses less power. Uh, it's more efficient, you can go further on the same amount of electricity. The other thing that it does is it makes the regenerative braking a little firmer. So when you let off the accelerator, the car starts to slow down and up on the dashboard, uh, what's gonna happen is that needle is going to go left into the charge and that's without touching the brakes, that's automatic. So now with the B mode, um, some similarities and some differences. So in B, you have pretty hard accelerating. You can, you can really take off. Um, and to me, it feels like it's even a little more juicy than drive. But on the other side of things, in B, B really stands for braking. So when you let off the accelerator, uh, it starts regenerative braking, just like Eco does, but even more firmly. Uh, to me, B is kind of jerk driving mode. You, you kind of do uh, jackrabbit starts, and the moment you let off the accelerator, you start slowing. Um, it is good for bumper to bumper traffic, traffic jams, that sort of thing. The other thing I've found is it works really, really well for towing. It is the secret hitting, hidden towing mode. So with that, you have more power to accelerate with a trailer. And when you let off the accelerator, it starts automatically braking for you. And now, of course, even if you're in drive and you let off the accelerator, there's a little tiny bit of regenerative braking. Not much. It's, it's similar to drive in a Prius. There's a little bit of regen, but not a whole heck of a lot. So when you want to charge the car, first thing you have to do is open the charging port. That's this little guy right here. You just pull that. And there's also a second charging port on this car. This is right where the gas flap release is on a lot of cars. On the left side of the car, this is the high-speed Chitamo charging port. Uh, so this is where you would connect an external DC fast charger, and you can charge 80% battery in 30 minutes or less. Now on the passenger side of the car, this is the typical charge port. This is the J1772 connector. Uh, this is a standard connector on all plug-in cars except Tesla. And of course, there's even an adapter between Tesla and J1772 as well. Uh, you can plug in off of 120 volts or 240 volts. Now, any plug-in electric vehicle you purchase is going to come with a portable EVSC, electric vehicle supply equipment. Uh, it's typically going to be 120 volts for uh, US vehicles, um, which they're slow. 120 volts uh, it ends up really limiting the current to the car, um, but they're all going to have the same style connection on the end. And sometimes there's confusion over how long it takes to charge an electric car. Uh, basically, what I do when I get home is I pull into my garage, uh, park the car, and I just press the release to uh, pop this open. I walk over, open this, open that, plug that in, and walk away. Uh, it takes about three seconds to do. Now, of course, it takes a while for the car to charge, but typically, you're almost, almost always doing that at night, you know, while you're asleep, or possibly if you can charge at work, um, while you're sitting at a desk at work all day. Uh, so really, to charge an electric car, frankly, it takes about three seconds. Uh, the total charge time for this car, uh, typically on an empty battery on 240 volts, it's 45 hours. Uh, so even if I drive somewhere in the morning and I'm back home, uh, often I will plug it in and that way I'll be at a full charge when I need to take the vehicle out again sometime later. Now, one of the other really cool things about electric vehicles is that they're the easiest way to be able to uh, get around using renewable energy. Uh, this summer, I installed solar panels on my garage. It's nice and sunny out right now. And uh, I, the faceplate on these solar panels is 6,240 6, watts. Real world, uh, you know, the sun doesn't perfectly line up with the panels, uh, things like that. It's about 5,000 watts. Now, the charger that's in this car is about 3,300 watts. So in the middle of a sunny day, I can actually charge the car directly from the sun 
output my extra electricity to my house and even at that point whatever's left over just goes out to my neighbors so i can actually overproduce in the summer on the system uh, now in the winter uh, right now this is kind of uh, uh, the rare sunny day uh, but it's kind of a, a law of averages and i designed the system so that year round on average i'm making as much electricity as i use including charging an electric car now the other thing that you're probably going to see uh, behind me is this giant shadow because i've got a big pine tree up here and we get these really really long exaggerated uh, shadows this time of year the sun is just so low in the sky um, i'm at about 43 degrees north latitude um, not as far north as some people but a lot further north than a lot of people um, but even in southeastern wisconsin solar really works well and it makes a lot of sense and one of the reasons why I did the solar on top of my garage was to get it up above the shadow of my house, uh, some of my neighbor's trees, things like that. Even there, I don't have any control over my neighbor's trees. So the other thing I did here is I used microinverters. So even if one of the solar panels is shaded, all of those other solar panels are still running at full production. So electric vehicles are really a fantastic way to make use of renewable energy like solar. One other thing I wanted to mention is that I really like the headroom that I have in this car. I'm a six foot tall guy and frankly I'm just not that comfortable in something like a Volt or a Prius. Now the downside of that extra headroom, uh, this car it's a little taller and it's not as aerodynamic. However height wise it's the exact same height as a Toyota RAV4. Uh, I just happened to be in a parking lot one time and noticed that and so many people in my area think that they need an SUV just to get around. Uh, actually, this car is rear wheel drive, which traditionally we think would be really, really bad for snowy areas, but it has electronic traction control that actually works really, really well. Uh, the other thing is with electrics, traction control is amazing. Um, you can think of it like uh, being digital. It just really, really works very nice, but I can always override it and turn it off. So maybe if I want to go do a uh, some donuts in a snowy winter parking lot, I could do that as well. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you is the preheat feature. Uh, this is a key fob that came with the car. Of course, I got my uh, power locks and alarm right here on the key, but this key fob uh, gives me the ability to heat up the car when the car is plugged into the wall. So for example, I'll put the car into the garage at night, I'll plug the car in for it to start charging, and the next morning, I can use the controls on here to turn on the heat in the car. Uh, if I was in a hot part of the country, I'm down in Las Vegas or someplace like that, I could also pre-air condition the car. Uh, I also like the fact that instead of using a heat mode, I can use a defrost mode that will uh, kick on the heated seat, it will blow hot air up onto the dashboard uh, and the windshield, and it's actually powerful enough, it'll melt snow and ice right off of there. It also turns on the electric rear defrost as well. So if the car's out in the driveway, um, all the snow, all the ice melted completely off of it. It's just a, a fantastic feature. And that power is coming from that wall power connection, not from the battery. So in the winter, I can leave with a full, a full battery and a nice warm car. It's a great feature. So I hope you liked this little tour of my uh, 2012 Mitsubishi iMeve electric car, and I'll see you later.